As, as you know, um, was telling, um, this uh, is going to be the topic of my application talk. So, um, just an overview. Uh, so, what we did in um, this work, um, we were um, using uh, Joe cells, Chinese answer ovary cells. Uh, we were uh, transfecting or co transfecting those cells with. Um, subunits of uh, potassium channel, they were uh, fluorescently tagged. Um, and then uh, to uh, study their dynamics and oligomerization state, uh, we were using a curve microscopy. So we were um, getting uh, the illumination and signal only from the membrane. And our time lapse uh, was then analyzed uh, with three different um, fluctuation uh, techniques that probably you heard about a lot during this workshop. So they're going to be IMSD, uh, number and brightness, and 2D per correlation. A brief introduction of the voltage-gated potassium channel. Uh, they are formed by uh, four alpha subunits, uh, each of one as a voltage sensing domain, and they are regulated by one or more beta subunit. Um, some of these channels, for example, the one that we're interested in, uh, KC and Q1, um, are constitutionally active at resting membrane potentials and also have a role, uh, for example, in epithelial cells. Um, the complex that we're interested into, that is KC and Q1, that is the main subunit, and KC and E2, that is one of the beta subunits from the KC and E family. Um, is an epithelial complex that is essential for normal gastric thyroid and choroid plexus function. And we were trying to address some uh, question about the molecular composition and the subunit dynamics of this um, channel. So the first step um, for us, uh, so this is a collaboration, I forgot to mention, between our labs, so between um, me, uh, Michelle, Enrico, and uh, Lorenzo, that you heard that talked uh, yesterday about the spectrophase report, um, and uh, Professor Abbott, uh, still at UCI. So in their lab, um, they proved that the fluorescent tagging uh, of our subunits uh, that uh, will be either uh, uh, MEGFP or MTERI don't alter the channel functionality. So their lab um, did some measurements uh, with um, whole cell patch clamps, and um, they saw that the um, currents uh, generated by the uh, tagged version of KC and Q1 show similar properties to the, um, the one that normally you can see when the KC and Q1 is not tagged. Um, also, they saw that the uh, tagged version of the KC and Q1, KC and E2 were constantly active, um, and they were expressing a small occurrence compared to the uh, KC and Q1 alone. Uh, and that was similar to what they were observing with the correspondent uh, untagged version of the channels. So once we uh, made sure that uh, our system wasn't altered for the physiology part, uh, we moved to um, our part of measurements. So as I mentioned before, we were using a curve microscope. So, and um, for some of our sample, we were either using uh, the GFP tagging or the MTERI tagging. So our system have a two excitations. And then as I was mentioning, since we're looking at our proteins in the membrane, we were using the turf mode where only a single plane is illuminated so we were collecting uh, the signal coming essentially only from, from the membrane. And then our exit signal were uh, detected and then split them in two channels. And we were using a CMOS camera. Thank you. Uh, so if you remember, we were um, saying that our um, data set uh, will be analyzed with the three different uh, Techniques. So the first one is IMSD, image mean square displacement. Uh, this technique, just a brief summary, um, can use the uh, special temporal of fluorescent fluctuation uh, caused by the protein diffusions to obtain um, the, a picture of the protein mobility in the nano environment. 
Uh, in particular, from the equation, uh, you can um, extrapolate different uh, interesting parameters for the um, protein dynamic. Um, for example, the size of the domains in which a problem is diffusing, uh, length of confinement, the diffusion coefficient um, inside these domains, the micro, and across the domains, macro, um, and also the uh, mode of diffusion. Uh, in particular, we can see here a schematic representation of the free mode of diffusion, so the protein can go anywhere, the confined mode, so there's the strong domains, uh, or the transiently confined. Applying that to all of our um, samples, so either uh, the channels, uh, the subunit, the beta subunit transfected alone, or the alpha subunit transfected alone, or the co-transfection, um, we could see that for all of these conditions, the best model applied is the transiently confined model diffusion in the membrane. Uh, independently, if the subunits were um, expressed alone or co-expressed. Going into the details of the parameters that we could obtain from this analysis, we first noticed that analyzing the microdiffusion, uh, we saw that when E2 was co-transfected with T1, we could see two distinct populations. So we decided to split our distribution in two, uh, and we were calling uh, this one, like the slow um, E2Q1 population, and this is the fast E2Q1 um, population. So as you can see from here, um, the E2 slow population has a similar behavior and if we're looking at the day macro and the length of confinement compared to the E2 when transfected alone. Um, while if we're looking, for example, at the length of confinement, the E2 fast population was displaying a similar behavior to the T1 or the T11 co-expressed with E2. So um, our uh, conclusion from that was that um, the E2 fast population was um, probably the one that was binding with the Q1, while the E2 population represent the unbound population. Uh, we also tested uh, if there was some dependency um, from these parameters to the expression level. Um, and here we base um, that on the intensity, at least for the range of intensities that for expression level that we were considering, we didn't see um, any dependence on the um, expression levels for any of these parameters, no matter if the proteins were singularly expressed or co-expressed. So that was our finding for MSD, the first uh, kind of analysis that we did. Um, then we perform another kind of analysis that is the 2D per correlation function. So just briefly, um, this is an important kind of analysis that measures the directionality of the protein diffusion. So with this kind of analysis, we can build map of diffusion uh, for the entire image. Uh, by cross-correlating the pixel as a function of time and in different angular direction. So uh, by seeing the deformation of the um, percorrelation function, uh, we can somehow see uh, if the protein is facing an obstacle. So, um, and we can discriminate therefore between an isotropic diffusion where uh, we can use eccentricity um, as a parameter. So if the protein uh, as an isotropic diffusion, uh, the eccentricity is going uh, more towards zero, where uh, if you have ob obstacles, the eccentricity is going higher. So we have an isotropic uh, kind of diffusion. For this kind of analysis for our project, we carried out uh, this analysis at different per correlation distances. So here you can see our results. Uh, so we calculated um, the TDPCF function at five different distances. Here you can see the corresponding nanometer di uh, distances uh, for all of our uh, samples. Uh, we can see that KC and Q1 in green, whether a singularly expressed or co-expressed, show uh, uh, low eccentricity 
that is comparable with our um, inert control that is like a um, membrane bound form of uh, MEGFP. Um, then we saw that for uh, the E subunit, they show, especially at longer distance, a higher eccentricity. And they show uh, either the E2 alone or the two population of the E2 co-expressed uh, a similar behavior. If we are going at the short uh, correlation distance, we can see that E2 has a stronger eccentricity, uh, E2 fast, sorry, um, uh, showing a, a stronger eccentricity. That means that E2 fast um, is localizing in uh, different membrane domains where they have like a more pronounced motion directionality. And here you can see an example of the map that you can build um, based on the eccentricity value. So we can see, for example, that overall, uh, if you increase the um, per correlation distance, you have like a higher eccentricity for all of the um, cases, but then you can see differences in the behavior. And this is a comparison with intensities. Uh, the last technique that we applied on the same data set is number and brightness. Um, so this kind of analysis calculates the average variance of intensity distribution for each, each pixel and uh, is able to determine the concentration, so the, for the number uh, of the proteins and their aggregation state. Uh, in this case, um, it is mandatory to use a reference of a protein that is known to be a monomer. So in this case, as I was mentioned, we were using the um, monomeric version of EGFP um, with the variance that is bound to the membrane to have a better reference. Um, here you can see our results. So um, for KCNE2, uh, we proved that it exists as dimer when it's expressed alone. And then for our co-expression, we see that the fast population is in the form of a tetramer, while the slow population is, um, you can see here that it's between a dimer and a tetramer. So um, since the trimeric version is not physiologically possible for this kind of channel, uh, we interpreted that as a mixture of dimer and tetramers. Um, while here, you can see that for the Q1, uh, either is alone or co-expressed, um, they exist as a tetramer, and that is confirmed uh, by other studies in, um, in the literature. Um, okay, and here, as I mentioned, we have our monomeric control for the uh, GAP EGFP. Um, since I was mentioning that um, with this kind of analysis, we're using the same data set and we're applying the three different kind of analysis on the exact same sample, we can also try uh, to understand better, uh, for example, a correlation between what we see in the 2DPCF map and what we see in uh, the map of brightness and therefore the aggregation state. So just an example here, you can see in this region, here you have um, higher brightness region, and here you also have a corresponding uh, strong uh, motion directionality uh, from the 2D PCF. While for example here, there's another region with a strong um, eccentricity, but that doesn't correspond to higher brightness. So um, this kind of analysis can be uh, important to, uh, to study um, in general membrane uh, proteins and try to correlate the differences in different points of the membranes. So then we decided since we have like so many parameters and so many data to try to create a representation, uh, in this case, the spider plot uh, to show the combination, all the, the parameters that we can obtain with this uh, multiplex analysis. And finally, uh, we try to build a visual model uh, for the behavior of this uh, complex. So in particularly, um, here you can see that for all of the conditions, 
they're going from the um, beta subunit alone or the alpha subunit alone or the um, co-transfections. You can see here um, that the uh, confinement is represented by these square domains. Uh, and the size of these is the same as the size of confinement for each of the uh, conditions. Then uh, we were representing the micro and micro diffusion with these circles, respectively the dark blue and the light blue ones. And um, the diameters was the distance, average distance uh, in this two time. Uh, the directionality that we can get from the 2D uh, PCF was represented by these two ellipses. Uh, where the eccentricity of the inner one is uh, the eccentricity from the short range to the PCF, and the outer one is the eccentricity of the uh, large range, um, the largest range that we consider for the two PCF. Um, finally, uh, here there's a zoom in. Uh, we were trying to represent the aggregation state uh, that we were obtaining from the number and brightness analysis. So here, as I was mentioning, we have E2, that is a dimer, uh, Q1, that is a tetramer. And when they are interacting, they're most likely having like a four to four um, aggregation. So to conclude this, as I was mentioning, we found that this channel exists as an octamer with a four to four um, ratio. Uh, we studied the dynamic of the singular subunit and the uh, co-transfected subunit, and all of these findings can improve the understanding of the physiology of this channel. And from the methodology part, um, I would like to highlight that um, the use of the turf imaging um, that is um, really used for membrane studies uh, can be done in combination with all of these techniques. So from the date, same data set, you can get information about the oligomerization state for NNB, the diffusion modality for MSD, and uh, the nano environment organization. So this is an approach that can be easily applied to uh, a large variety of different kinds of studies.